You know I have criticized Mitt Romney in the past. In 2012, I campaigned for not one but two of his competitors. In 2016, I ignored all his stupid warnings about Trump. Since that time, I have regularly lambasted him for holding up good, important Republican policy priorities. But it would seem as though Mitt Romney is coming around. He has just announced that he will not hold up President Trump's Supreme Court nominee. The decision to proceed now with the President Trump's nominee is also consistent with history. Um, I came down on the side of uh, the Constitution and precedent as I've studied it uh, and, uh, and make the decision on that basis. Very good news. We're all excited. He's right that the precedent is on the side of Trump, that the Constitution is on the side of Trump. I think it's 19 times in U.S. history we've been in this situation where a president during an election year has to fill a Supreme Court vacancy and he's got the White House and he's got the Senate. And 17 out of those 19 times, the nominee has gone through. I believe it's two out of 10 times when either Either party has either the Senate or the White House, but not both. And there's a Supreme Court vacancy during the fourth year of a, of a presidential administration. Only two out of 10 times has that nominee gone through. Majority of those times, nominee hasn't gone through. So Mitt Romney is looking at president. He's looking at the Constitution. He's saying, OK, this is the right thing to do. But what's even more interesting than that kind of base level analysis and what he's actually doing is his further reasoning for why we need a Supreme Court nominee. Well, I think it's straightforward in terms of the quali qualifications you look for, which is someone who is an expert of the law, someone who has a record of fairness and judgment that you think is consistent with the law. Uh, I prefer choosing those folks who uh, are, uh, if you will, strict constructionists, meaning that they look at the law itself and the Constitution, as opposed to sort of looking into the sky and pulling out ideas that they think may be more appropriate than either the law or the Constitution. So I, I recognize that we... Uh, uh, we may have a court which has more of a uh, conservative bent than it's had over the last uh, few decades. But my liberal friends have, over many decades, gotten very used to the idea of having a liberal court. And that's not written in the stars. Uh, and I know that a lot of people are saying, gosh, we don't want that change. I understand the energy associated with that perspective. But it's also appropriate for a nation, which is, if you will, center right, uh, to have a court which reflects uh, center-right points of view, which again are not changing uh, the, the law from what it states, but instead following the law and following the Constitution. He's still a full-throated moderate. He hasn't become some MAGA, hat-wearing, Trumpy Republican. He's not a populist, none of that. What Mitt Romney is doing is making a moderate case for Trump, for Trump's priorities for Trump's Supreme Court nominee. This is a big shift because what we've been hearing for the whole presidential election is Trump is extreme, he's radical. We've heard this from, from even people like Mitt Romney. But now with the left burning down the country, with the left willing to torch our traditions and our political institutions, there is no moderate left. There's no moderate argument to be made for the left or for the Democrats. And so the only place for a moderate like Mitt to go is for the Republicans, for Donald Trump for this important priority right now to shift the balance of the court. Center right country, we need a center right court, not a far extreme left court. And that's the only type of leftism that's left. I'm Michael Knowles, this is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment from yesterday is men bad, women good, but Michael, how can they say they believe that when they also say there's no such thing as either of those? Yes, this is very confusing because on the one hand, they'll say there's a patriarchy and men have oppressed women through all of history, but actually there's no such thing as men are or women and sex is not fixed and men can become women and vice versa. And you think, well, okay, if there's a patriarchy and horrible oppression and misogyny all around the world and women can become men, well, why don't women just become men? And then they don't have to deal with the, the oppression, actually, then they can become the oppressor class. But of course, they don't believe those arguments in themselves. They don't believe that either there are men or women or that men can become women. They only believe in power. They believe in making whatever argument augments their power. 
And, and so there's no objective reality that we're referring to. It's all just a battle of interest and a battle of will. And this argument, I mean, the men and women thing is somewhat recent, but, but the, the basis of that argument, that politics is merely about interest, it's not about reason and argument and objective reality, that goes back at least a couple hundred years on the left. But we're very uh, happy now because there are some people who have been squishy in the middle who have, you know, given in a little bit to the left, even though their premises are totally wrong, who now, because those premises have been taken to their logical conclusions, are saying, gosh, I got to go with the guys on the right. I don't like Trump. I don't like what he stands for, I guess, but he's the more moderate guy. Now, we're, we're also told at the same time, no, 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 forget about that. Biden is a moderate. Biden's been a moderate his whole career. Hey, suburban women, vote for Joe Biden. Don't vote for Donald Trump. Joe Biden is now making this argument himself. He was asked how he's going to stop socialism and the extremism of the radical left, which is torching the country. What does he say? He says, look, I've been a moderate my whole career. I'm no socialist. I defeated the socialist. Talk to the voters that are worried about socialism and you raising taxes. First of all, I guarantee, I promise, I've never broken my word. Anyone making less than $400,000 will not see one single penny in their tax raised. Number two, I beat the socialists. That's how I got elected. That's how I got the nomination. Do I look like a socialist? Look at my career, my whole career. I am not a socialist. He is not a socialist. I agree with that. I am not going to make the argument that Joe Biden, even though he's tried to pretend to be Scranton working class, regular old Joe for most of his career, is now all of a sudden a radical Marxist or something like that. That's not the problem. The problem is he's so weak that the socialists and other type of extremists in the Democratic Party are actually the ones calling the shots. It, it's not that Joe Biden has all of a sudden become a radical. He's, by the way, he's not a moderate either. He's just an empty suit. He doesn't believe in anything. All he wants to do is smile and smack you on the back. It's actually why I didn't even jump on the bandwagon of how Joe is a sexual predator because of the hair sniffing and all that sort of stuff. I don't suspect that that is actually a sort of sexual... Uh, impulse of his. I think he's just a glad handing politician who wants to make you feel really special. So you vote for him, even though he doesn't believe in anything. He's not appealing to you on an ideological or philosophical basis. He's only appealing to you on this personal level. So if things go to the left, he'll go to the left. If things go to the right, he'll go to the right, right? He's, he's relatively moderate on abortion, I guess, for most of his career. Now the Dems are pro-abortion, like super duper pro-abortion. So he swings all the way in the other direction, says taxpayers should, should fund it. Uh, that's, that's Joe Biden, which, which way the wind blows. There are ideologues behind him though. And the ideologues behind him right now, the ones calling the shots are radical far left. There was, there, there was one big endorsement he just picked up from a communist terrorist, which we'll get into in a second, because this, this issue of your taxes going up, this issue of your property being taken away is a very important one. And that means you got to save your pennies now. And the best way to do that is with Pure Talk USA. Pure Talk USA can save you so much money on your cell phone. You think that all the money you pay for your cell phone, that's just what you got to pay. And then the amount goes up every month and, and, it, and you don't know how it's going to be. Maybe it's $130 one month, maybe it's $150 another month. That's just the way it is, right? If you want to get AT&T or Sprint or T-Mobile service and network and coverage. Actually, what if I told you, you could get the exact same coverage, the exact same network, the exact same towers for half the price. That's what Pure Talk USA does. Costs you half, no contract, no excessive fees. How do they do that? Well, because they don't have a zillion dollar marketing campaign and all this crazy infrastructure. They come straight to you. They pass the savings along and they've got customer service right here in the US. You can get for instance, unlimited talk, unlimited text, two gigs of data for, drum roll please, 20 bucks a month. 20 bucks a month. Not 20 bucks a month plus $100 in fees. 20 bucks. Period. Done. The average person right now saving 400 bucks a year with Pure Talk USA. Got a plan to fit every need and budget. Here is the deal. Unlimited talk, unlimited text, two gigs of data, 20 bucks a month. All you need to do, grab your mobile phone right now that you're probably overpaying for, dial pound 250 and say keyword Michael Knowles. You've got to say that magical keyword. That is pound 250. To use the way the kids talk now, hashtag 250. Say keyword Michael Knowles. When you do, you will save 50% off your first month. You're going to want to save that money now because the radicals are coming for your money. A communist terrorist 
Angela Davis, just a couple months ago, endorsed Joe Biden. But I thought Joe Biden's a moderate. I thought Joe Biden wasn't a socialist. I thought Joe Biden wasn't a radical. Sure, okay, but the radicals believe that Joe Biden will be very easily manipulated. Here's Angela Davis explaining the strategy. I don't see this election as being about choosing a candidate who will be, who will be able to lead us in the right direction. It will be about choosing a candidate who can be most effectively pressured into allowing more space for the evolving anti-racist movement. That's, that's the new term they're calling it, the anti-racist movement. But ironically, of course, the anti-racist movement is very racist, just like how, you know, they, they always have these misnomers. They're always projecting things. And we'll get to that because there's some very funny evolving racism among the anti-racist movement and some good ways to counter it as well. But Angela Davis, she is a very radical and very prominent and very influential left winger. She, she is cited by lots of leading left wingers. She's a professor and she's saying, yeah, I don't think Joe Biden is some radical, but we can manipulate him. We can pressure him. Obviously we can. The guy doesn't know which end is up. The guy doesn't know where he is on earth half of the time. And so you put him in, but he's not really going to be running the show. As Joe Biden said, they're going to take Joe Biden. They're going to put him in a home. He's going to watch TV. And then the radicals are going to be running the show. Bob Avakian, the leader of the revolutionary communist party, who did he endorse? Take a guess. Joe Biden. And I actually went to a Bob Avakian rally to cover it. I think there's a video of it somewhere on YouTube. These guys are burning the American flag, talking about tearing down police stations, talking about colonial oppression. I went to this thing maybe six, eight months ago. And at that time, it was so ridiculous. They just looked like a bunch of idiots. Now they sound like mainstream Democrats. And actually, as we were editing that video, I said, oh my gosh, they really are starting to sound like mainstream Democrats, not because they're moderating, but because the mainstream Democrats are radicalizing. He endorsed Biden too. Why? For the same reason. And you just need to listen to Joe Biden talk for two seconds to realize that this guy, even if he were a so-called moderate, is not going to be able to stand up to the radical forces in his party, on his side of the aisle. Joe Biden was just recently waxing philosophic about the mental stress of uh, the campaigns of the presidency. And as he's trying to describe mental stress, he obviously is undergoing a lot of mental stress, can't quite get the words out. We have to make sure we have more, more social workers and, and, and psychologists in our schools. We have, look, we learned drug abuse isn't, doesn't cause mental illness. Mental stress and mental, and, and mental illness cause drug abuse. We've learned so much that we can change so much. And that's why we ought to have to make sure that the, the super wealthy start paying their fair share. So we can do the things we have to do to make life better for hardworking middle-class folks. So whatever type of mental stress Joe Biden is trying to fix, I think he needs to solve that in his own self first, and then he can maybe help the rest of the country with mental stress. I don't even really know what argument he's trying to make. He's saying drug abuse causes mental stress or mental stress causes drug abuse, and you've got to stop the mental stress and you've got to, I don't know, something about taxes. I don't know. He, he's kind of all over the place when he's on the campaign trail because unless he's got a teleprompter in front of him, he can't follow his own trains of thought. I mean, even on simple things, he's trying to make some argument about, about I don't know, mental health, I guess, even though it calls it mental stress. But then even a, a simple statement like the Pledge of Allegiance, Joe Biden tries to recite at a campaign event, can't get through it. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America, one nation, indivisible, under God, for real. One nation, indivisible, under God, for real, you know, you know, I pledge allegiance to you, to the flag of the thing under the, the, you know, you know, the thing. This is not, it's actually a good symbol of the Democratic Party. Joe Biden isn't bumbling the Pledge of Allegiance because he hates his country and wants to tear down the Pledge of Allegiance. I think he generally likes his country. He's tearing it down because he, he can't keep up. His, his mind is not where it should be. And so the people who do want to tear down the Pledge of Allegiance, the people who don't want to recite that, the people who do want to tear this country to the, to the ground, they are the ones who are gaining power. How has Joe Biden performed so far? 
the way he's done relatively well, at least in say the Democratic National Convention, is he reads off a teleprompter. We know that. I don't think we're telling any tales out of school. Whenever he is totally on the prompter, almost whenever he's totally on the prompter, he's okay. When he's off the prompter, you can tell that this guy can barely string a sentence together. The trouble is the presidency is off prompter. (laughs) The presidency, if you want to lead your presidency, if you want to lead the country, you've got to be the one writing the words. You've got to be the one creating the priorities. And and Trump is digging very deeply into that right now. President Trump is now focusing on something. It might be the greatest national recognition of rot at the heart of our country in well over a century right? He's the one seeing what's going on. He's the one leading. With Joe Biden, someone else is writing his lines for him in the teleprompter. And sometimes that teleprompter breaks, not just in speeches, not just when he's doing a convention. Apparently, they're even scripting his answers to interviews, and he can't even get through that. There are going to be no deportations in the first 100 days of my campaign. Let me get that right. You are going to freeze deportations? Freeze deportations for the first 100 days. And then and only people will be deported are people who committed a felony while here. That's number one. I, okay, I lost that. Line. Yeah, well, it's, but that's good because we could we could talk to you and I on that. Okay, uh, but but it's, <laughs> but but th- th- think about think about where we are today. There were more than- Did you see that? He, so the first thing they do poorly in this interview is Joe Biden makes it clear when he's facing the prompter and when he's facing the questioner because he's talking to the questioner, the questioner asks a question. Then he turns to his left and he's clearly reading something off of the camera. And then if that weren't blatant enough, the, I guess the prompter operator didn't get his answers up fast enough. He goes, and number two, oh, sorry, I can't get number two yet. Hold on. Can you get me? Can you? And then the, the interviewer tries to, to make up for it. And then Biden turns back to the interviewer. So it's clear that there's a, a place that he's facing when he's reading the answers. And then he turns and he faces the interviewer. And he doesn't know number two because he doesn't know what he's running on because he doesn't know how his administration is going to be run because it ain't going to be run by him. There is no moderate left anymore in effect, in practice. You might have a couple guys writing columns who say they're moderate, but in the actual practice of politics and government, there is no moderate left. Even the mainstream leftist voices are radical, including Don Lemon, who used to be a kind of moderate guy on CNN, who used to talk about how, yes, maybe there were some problems in the inner cities. Maybe these Republicans have a point. Maybe Bill O'Reilly has a point. He used to say that on CNN. Now, though, because the whole left has moved so far, so far into the extreme, he's not. Now he's talking about blowing up the system. No matter what happens, everybody sticks to the We're going to have team. to blow up the entire system. And you know what we're going to have to do? No, I don't know about You know that. what we're going to, yes, yeah. what you're going to have to do? You just got to vote. Honestly, from what your closing argument is, you're going to have to get rid of the Electoral College. Because the people... I don't see it. Uh, because the, the minority in this country decides who the judges are and they decide who the president is. is but that, you need a is constitutional amendment to do that. And if Democrats, if Joe Biden wins, Democrats can sack the courts and they can do that amendment and they can get it passed. Well, you that's need two-thirds a, a vote in the Congress and three-quarters of the state legislature. They may be able to do that. Maybe. So Don Lemon, first of all, doesn't understand how laws are passed, or maybe he really understands how laws are passed. Because what it sounds like he's saying is, look, they can stack the court and they can do that amendment. But of course, the the amendment process does not involve the courts. It doesn't come from the courts. It comes from our lawmakers and it comes from the states. can come from the states. But maybe Don Lemon sees something clearly, which is, oh, actually the courts do make laws, which is why if Joe Biden wins, he's got to stack the courts. But those words, we got to blow up the system. We got to get rid of the Electoral College. We've got to stack the courts. We need to have a full power grab that will allow us to arbitrarily exercise our interests forever. Forever, right? Because at that point, when when you do the things that Democrats are talking about, add new states to the country, get rid of the Electoral College, uh, stack the court, then it's not as though in five years after that or six years after that, you're going to have a shift of power in the country. What they're trying to do is have a permanent majority. And I think the phrase blow up the country is pretty apt because that's what they've been doing for six months. They've been literally blowing it up. They've been literally setting it on fire. They've been tearing down our statues. They've been, they've been rewriting our history. They've been blowing up our curricula. They are now threatening not to concede the election. I guess they're promising not to concede the election. Hillary Clinton says Joe Biden shouldn't concede under any circumstances. Well, here, here, how about this circumstance? Trump wins in a landslide. 
Nope. Now, according to Hillary, Joe Biden shouldn't concede under any circumstances. They're already doing that. And this didn't just begin with CNN. This didn't just begin with some election or the Biden campaign. This didn't just begin there. It began at an intellectual level. There is an intellectual rot that has permeated the country through the university system, now into corporate America, now even into the administrative government. That rot comes from what is called critical theory. Critical theory, and specifically what is now at issue is critical race theory. What is critical race theory? Trump has gone out against it. He just tweeted out yesterday, quote, a few weeks ago, I banned efforts to indoctrinate government employees with divisive and harmful sex and race-based ideologies. Today, I've expanded that ban to people and companies that do business with our country, the U.S. military, government contractors, and grantees. Americans should take should be taught to take pride in our great country. And if you don't, there's nothing in it for you. He's basically saying we are not going to give away our money to people who are seeking to destroy our country. And and the term he's using here is critical race theory, though he's referring to sex-based ideologies as well. This is being spun by the mainstream media as President Trump coming out against racial discrimination training. He's saying no critical theory training and anymore. And you know, the, the mainstream media actually have a point here because critical race theory might properly be called racial discrimination training. It is training in how to racially discriminate. <laughs> it, is, it is actual training in racial discrimination, not in anti-racial discrimination, not in anti-racism. It is training in how to be a racist. And it is now being mandated in boardrooms around the country, in schools around the country, and even in government offices around the country. And it is wicked, and it is dumb, and it is stupid, and we should get rid of it. It, it is a, a key component of a national rot in this country. What is critical race theory? Critical race theory in particular was developed in the 1980s. It derives, as do many of these stupid left-wing academic theories, from Karl Marx. Karl Marx, who uh, famously called for the ruthless criticism of all that exists. Very simple. The ruthless criticism of all that exists. This, uh, this applies, this criticism, to race specifically. What it means is white people bad, black people good, Western civilization is evil, America's evil, got to burn it all down. This is the intellectual framework of the BLM movement, of the radical, avowedly Marxist BLM movement. It all comes from the same thing. It's being taught in rooms all around the country, and Trump sees this national rot. And we are about to see a city go up in flames again. I can predict it almost as surely as I can predict the sun will rise in the morning. What is that over? It's over another left-wing lie. We'll get to that in one second. But first, I've, I've got to see things clearly using my wonderful new prescription glasses from Coastal. Coastal will allow you to get very nice, high-quality prescription glasses for as low as, what do you say, $900? No. $90? No. $9. Just $9 with free shipping and 30-day risk-free returns. They're great. They have a, a wonderful selection. Uh, you got to go check out their selection. But when you check it out, you don't just need to look at pictures and you don't even need to order the glasses home and try it on. Then you'll like this and you got to go back to the store and put the postage on, send it back. You don't need to do that. They have the most advanced virtual try on technology anywhere. It's unbelievable. You can do it from your phone. You can do it from your computer. You just click the glasses, you click try it on and you can see how it looks on your face. And then you can move your head all around and the glasses will follow with you. And it's sized right. And it's just really, really useful. It will save you hours at the store. It will save you hundreds of dollars on glasses. Go to coastal.com, pick the frames you want, see how they look on you. Right now through October 31st, they're offering our listeners the best deal they have anywhere. If you want to just 50% off your first pair of glasses. Coastal.com slash Michael. See clearly with coastal.com. Get free shipping, 30-day risk-free returns, 50% off at coastal.com slash Michael. This is only until October 31st. C-O-A-S-T-A-L-D-O-T dot com slash Michael. Some restrictions apply. I never again want to hear that Donald Trump is not a true conservative. Specifically, I don't want to hear that 
from some egghead accountant who says that because Trump doesn't have a total open borders trade policy, he's not a true conservative. These squish, ridiculous technocrats who say Trump's not a true conservative because he's in any way deviated from the policy that Republicans embraced at think tank luncheons in 1998. No, Trump, Trump is a conservative. Trump sees this, this rot at the, the heart of our uh, national discourse that is now bleeding out into actual real world violence. He sees it when most Republicans don't, and he's actually doing some, something about it, which most Republicans would not have the courage to do. I don't think that a, a, an administration has seen national rot so clearly since uh, the 1850s and 60s, I mean, since, we were at, since the last time we were pouring out into the streets, killing each other and burning down the country. A real, a real essential problem, and, th- and that's what we're talking about when we talk about this ruthless criticism that all that exists tearing down the whole country, specifically in this case, applied to race. Critical race theory and its associated pathologies are not just destroying the country in theory, they're destroying it in practice. Right now, the Democratic mayor of Louisville, Mayor Greg Fisher, has issued an executive order declaring a state of emergency. State of emergency. Why? Why is there a state of emergency? Because the Louisville Metro Police Department uh, is also declaring a state of emergency why are they doing it? Not because of anything that has happened, but in anticipation of an announcement of its investigation in the Brianna Taylor case. Who's Brianna Taylor? Have you heard this story? This is one that the BLM activists and their lemmings on social media have, have used as the classic example of police racism and brutality. Say her name, Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor was shot by uh, the police. Uh, this was during a no-knock warrant, and they said she was killed in her sleep, and it was so absolutely awful. Of course, the facts of the case don't really correspond to that. Even the no-knock warrant doesn't correspond to reality, at least according to the police who say the, the issue here was they did knock. And so they knocked. This gave Brianna Taylor's accomplice a time to get a gun. The guy starts shooting at the cops, then the cops start shooting back, and sadly, Brianna Taylor is killed. We were told this woman was completely innocent then. It seems actually in the case, it would appear she had something to do with this drug trafficking ring. So now, because there's chance that the cops aren't going to be tarred and feathered and hanged and drawn and quartered as, as racist murderers, because maybe the facts in the case are different than what BLM was telling us, they're declaring a state of emergency because they fear that BLM is going to torch the city because probably they will, because BLM has done that in many other cities around the country. Not having anything to do with justice or injustice. Just that whenever there is a signal, something about, it could be a completely justified police shooting. That's the signal to go out and torch the city. And that is based not on any, it doesn't matter what these cases say, because according to critical race theory in particular, the country is rotten from the core and White people bad and black people good and Western civilization evil and you got to tear the thing down. Ruthless criticism, regardless of some particular case. Whenever some particular case doesn't turn out the way the left wants it to, they say, well, okay, that, that case doesn't prove our point. But it gets to a larger truth. The specific claim was wrong, but it gets to a larger truth. Well, what's the larger? I don't see any larger truth. Now, there is another way to fight back against this, not just in this executive order about critical race theory, but also in a very clever way that is going to upset a very, very many uh, people in higher education, very many people on the left. Now, if you want to uh, make people feel better, not upset them, but make them feel better, you should maybe have some beautiful artwork. You should give them beautiful artwork. You should allow them to preserve a beautiful memory. You can do that at paintyourlife.com. Get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at a truly affordable price. I love these guys. I tested them out when they came on the show because I thought it was too good to be true. There's no way that you could get a really high quality painting uh, for uh, you know, a r- reasonable price and, and have it come out the way that you want it to. I was wrong. So I, I checked it out with my stepbrother's wedding. I had him paint a painting. It was so gorgeous. I'm now having one done of a family member of mine. I cannot wait to get it. It is being finished up right now. Uh, you can work with them every step of the way. So I get a proof back and I say, no, I don't like this. Change this, change that, change this. 
it's, a, it's a wonderful gift. You can give it away to someone for a birthday, for Father's Day, for this day, for that day. You can also keep it for yourself, which is what I'm going to do this time. At PaintYourLife.com, there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. Right now is a limited time offer. Get 20% off your painting. 20% off already. It's already an unbelievable value. 20% off in free shipping. To get this offer, text the word right now, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, to 64,000. I cannot recommend this service highly enough. I love it. And as, as people who appreciate the finer things in life, we should all love some, some beautiful art on the walls. Text Michael to 64,000. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. We've got, into, got to get into my favorite story that has come out of not just higher education. It might be my favorite story that's been in the news all week. But first... I've got to say goodbye to uh, Facebook and YouTube, and I've got to thank our friends over at LifeLock, by the way. Identity theft, as you know, can become... <laughs> you thought I was about to send you away. No, first, before you go, you've got to make sure you protect yourself online. If you're like me, and I know you are, then you spend a lot of time online. Uh, right now, identity theft is, is a big deal. Because everyone's spending their time working from home, they're uh, doing remote learning from schools, Guess what? Criminal gangs are paying attention to this. They are hacking you. You can find your information sometimes available for sale on the dark web. I'm talking about your social security number. I'm talking about big stuff. It's very important to understand how cybercrime and an identity theft affect our lives. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can find out if your information is for sale on the dark web. Get your free dark web scan right now at lifelock.com slash Knowles. It's free. Go over there. It won't hurt. And there are a lot of people trying to get your data. Pick the plan that's right for you. Save up to 25% off your first year with promo code Knowles. That is a free scan at lifelock.com slash Knowles. 25% off with promo code Knowles. K-N-W-L-E-S. Head on over to The Daily Wire. We'll be right back with a lot more. So part of critical race theory now is that every institution has to say that it's racist, right? Because every institution is racist, especially in including the United States, because our whole civilization is hopelessly racist and sexist and bigoted and terrible and unjust and blah, blah, blah. So if the whole system is broken and evil, then the individual institutions have to be too. And, and you see this all the time. Every company says, we have to do more we are, we are wrong. We've been harming people of color and we've been harming women and we've been harming men who think they're women and we've been harming everybody for so many years, right? And this is just a, a part of the liturgy of liberalism now that we, we always go through and you hear it especially in higher education. So Princeton University just came out and said this. They've all been saying this for so long. The president of Princeton says that racism persists at the university and in society, quote, sometimes by conscious intention, but more often through unexamined assumptions and stereotypes, ignorance or insensitivity, and the systemic legacy of past decisions and policies. Now, what he's saying this for is to push the left-wing agenda that the universities now foment and then push into the administrative government that, that runs our country. So he, just, he doesn't expect there's a consequence to this. It's common sense. Of course, we're a racist institution at Princeton. So the Trump administration now the Department of Education, has opened a federal civil rights investigation into Princeton because Princeton's racist. And you can't, you can't have a racist institution that discriminates on the basis of race, except for affirmative action, which is actually the law and discriminates on the basis of race, especially in higher education. But that one's okay. But you certainly can't have a, an anti-black or, or anti-woman sort of discrimination, right? So Princeton in admitting this, opens themselves up to a federal civil rights investigation. I absolutely love it. They, they wrote, quote, you admitted Princeton's educational program is, and for decades has been, racist. And so they're going to investigate. I like this because these institutions have gotten away with murder, at least intellectual murder, at least national murder, because they, they tear down the country without any consequence. They're lauded for it. They're applauded. Until now. Okay, you're going to implicate yourself in racism? Well, okay, we're going to have to investigate you for that. I hope Princeton gets fined into oblivion. I, I, I am a little different than many other conservatives in that I, I know a lot of conservatives hate higher education. They hate 
the liberal arts education. They say that if you have to go to college, you know, just major in engineering or something like that, do something practical. I don't believe that. I I actually, I don't think you should go to a four-year college necessarily to study engineering or to study some more tangible, practical skill, a technical education. I think you can probably get that somewhere else. I do think you should get a liberal arts education. I do think you should read the great works of our civilization. I do think you should cultivate in yourself this, this kind of understanding of our culture. You know, we always talk uh, as conservatives about how important the culture is. And then those same conservatives don't want to cultivate their, their own uh, sensibilities and their own faculties of reason and their own understanding of our civilization. So I think it's very important to do all of that. I love liberal education. The problem is none of these schools, especially the elite schools like Princeton, really do that anymore. They don't want to cultivate our civilization. Sometimes they do it accidentally because of the legacies that they've got. But what they're actively trying to do is destroy that cultivation of our sensibilities and that cultivation of our civilization. And so you know what I say? If Princeton isn't doing the very basic thing it's supposed to do, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Who cares? Good. Find them into oblivion. I hope they do that. And I hope Harvard and Yale learn the lesson before they get investigated and find into oblivion too. When I think of the schools in this country that actually do what the schools are supposed to do, what do I think of? Franciscan University of Steubenville does a good job. Thomas Aquinas College does a good job. Hillsdale does a good job. Maybe St. John's, I don't, how many, I'm like on one hand here. How many universities and colleges do we have in this country? And they're the ones fomenting the radicalism. They're shaping the minds of young people. They are funding the administrative state. They're plying it with statistics and data and all of the allegedly scientific information on which our policies are based, but they're not really scientific. They're just political. They're just radical and extreme. Ain't no room for a moderate there. Okay. And it, so Mitt Romney, you might be shocked that, the, that the, the moderate path is to ram through this Trump nominee in an election year. I'd say that seems extreme. No, it's, it's just that the extremism on the left has become mainstream. You might be shocked to hear that the moderate path is to go after these universities and defund them and fine them for what they are admitting that they're doing. But that is the moderate path. That's the only, that's the only path back to any sort of moderate mainstream America. People have been so warped by this nonsense. They've been so radicalized that even now on the sports channel, ESPN, Max Kellerman, not that I watch ESPN a whole lot, and I certainly don't now that they've gone total lib, but Max Kellerman comes out, he says, the, the protests are peaceful. Ignore what you're seeing. It's just like every other guy on CNN and MSNBC standing in front of burning police headquarters. And they say, no, mostly peaceful, little fiery, but mostly peaceful. He goes out and he says, look, they're mostly peaceful. And whenever there is violence, it's extreme right-wing agitators. A few of the things he said when he talks about like Black Lives Matter, 93% of the protests are peaceful. The vast, overwhelming majority are peaceful. And by the way, the 7% that are not, they have a very broad definition of what's not quote unquote peaceful. For example, if you block traffic or something like that, or if you respond to police provocation. And even then, a big percentage of that, which we, that, that wasn't peaceful, is actually outside agitators, extremist right wing agitators posing as protesters in order to make the protests look bad. That's the first thing. Wow, brilliant analysis from Mr. Kellerman. The protests are totally peaceful, but actually they're violent, but the violence is caused by the cops. But no, actually the violence is caused by right-wing agitators that we never seem to find anywhere. They're not, but they're there. They just, they hide themselves. And how do they hide them? They they dress up like left-wing agitators. Yeah, yeah, that's the ticket. Yeah, and then they talk like left-wing agitators. Yeah, and they target all of the things that the left-wing agitators want to destroy, like the police stations. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Right-wing agitators are tearing down statues of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and looting businesses and stealing Nike shoes and Gucci bags and torching police stations. Right-wing agitators. Okay, not very convincing. By the way, that is obviously a conspiracy theory, right? I know the left always likes to say that anytime conservatives breathe too heavily. We're engaging in a conspiracy theory. You know, anytime anything comes out of our mouths, it's a conspiracy theory. But I'll give you an example. The left says that there's this crazy right-wing conspiracy theory, that there's an elite pedophile ring that involves heads of state and royalty and, you know, prime ministers and things like that. So we say, well, what about 
Jeffrey Epstein and, you know, Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton was flying all around there. And he had this, Bill Clinton had this kind of nice intimate dinner with Ghislaine Maxwell. That news just broke. And that was pretty recent. That was in like 2014. And you've got a lot of other, I don't know, it doesn't seem like a conspiracy theory. And then the guy, when they finally arrest him, he mysteriously dies in jail. And they say it's a suicide, even though apparently none of the cameras worked and all the guards went away. And I, you know, it just seems like it's not a conspiracy theory. That's a conspiracy. Right, that's, that's, the, that's the prominent right-wing example of a conspiracy theory. Here's, here's an example of a totally mainstream left-wing story. So mainstream, it's on the sports channel. All the left-wing agitators are secretly white right-wing agitators. Yeah, all the guys who say they're left-wing and, and dress up like left-wingers and torch left-wing targets, the targets of left-wingers, they're secretly right-wingers and they're just doing it ironically or something, right? Which is the conspiracy theory? Obviously, obviously the latter. So there's no reasoning here, okay, even on the sports channel. So yeah, is it, is it any wonder that Mitt Romney, who is a moderate, he's an actual moderate, is it any wonder that he says, gosh, in this environment, I got to choose between these two things. I guess I'm a Trump guy. I guess Trump is all of a sudden the moderate thing to do. The lies are outrageous. And on, on the topic of this Supreme Court nominee, we haven't seen anything yet. You think there's no way to attack a, a very qualified, well-spoken judge, mother of seven, two adopted from Haiti, takes her faith very seriously. Oh, there is. Newsweek publishes a completely false story. Completely false. 100% BS. Here's the headline. How Amy Coney Barrett's People of Praise group inspired The Handmaid's Tale. That's the whole story. Amy Coney Barrett is part of this charismatic Catholic group called People of Praise, and that group inspired The Handmaid's Tale, right? Except it didn't. So they still have the story up. They changed the headline, obviously. Still have the story up, though. Correction. This article's headline originally stated that People of Praise inspired The Handmaid's Tale. The book's author, Margaret Atwood, has never specifically mentioned the group as being the inspiration for her work. A New Yorker profile of the author from 2017 mentions a newspaper clipping as part of her research for the book of a different charismatic Catholic group, people of hope. Newsweek regrets the error. Correction. Uh, yeah, no, Margaret Atwood never said that this was true. And actually then we've got evidence that it's, we know it's not true. Um, but we're going to keep the article up anyway. That's all you're going to see until, until the election now, which is fine by me because there are still people in this country, believe it or not who don't pay a ton of attention to politics. They like just live their lives. They do normal things. They go to work, they may occasionally watch a movie or something and had spend time with their family. And they're going to see for the next month and a half, however long it is, abject lies, the, the public destruction of a very nice looking, smart, articulate, qualified mother of seven based on pure lies, based on nothing. That's what they're going to see. And those people who maybe they call themselves undecided, independent, moderate, how do you think that's going to push them in the presidential election? Another great mark for Amy Coney Barrett, Mike Lee, who was also up for the Supreme Court, is Senator Mike Lee from Utah. I thought he'd be a great candidate for the court. I thought Ted Cruz would be a great candidate for the court. I've been pushing for one of those guys, great constitutional lawyers, very clear on their thinking on the law, thought they'd be great on the court because we would know where they stand because they've got this huge public record in politics. And I, I think it's silly to try to pretend that uh, judges should never have anything to do with politics at any point in their career. You know, for, for much of this country's history, most of this country's history, sometimes people would go to the courts, then they'd go run for office and maybe they come back to the courts. You had a president who was a chief justice of the Supreme Court, William Howard Taft. You, you have all these you had all these guys. And then all of a sudden the last few decades, no, the court, you have to be on the court for life. It's like the, the Pope, you know, you shouldn't, you're not supposed to be able to resign the papacy. You're supposed to on your deathbed be still talking about the Supreme Court. I don't think that's necessary. I don't even think that's good. And so I was pushing for the, the senators, but Mike Lee is now coming out strongly saying Amy Coney Barrett is a, a leading choice for the court and she should get the spot. I expect that we're going to see Amy Coney Barrett being picked by the president, and I would support that nomination wholeheartedly. She's got a proven track record. Uh, she's someone who understands the difference uh, between judging and lawmaking. 
She understands that she's there to interpret the law based on what the words say, rather than on the basis of what some social scientist or lawyer might wish that it said. That's exactly the kind of person we need on the U.S. Supreme Court, and I think it will and should be her. This is an important endorsement because Lee is really strong on these con law matters. And so if he's coming in, he, because he was up for the job, and, and unlike Senator Cruz, who said, I don't want the job, Mike Lee is, has not said that he doesn't want the job. So for him to come out and say that, it seems as though it's going to be Amy Coney Barrett, right? That this would seem to be coordinated. And it's important to hear his opinion on it. And I'm glad he gives her a good review. So we'll, we'll see. President Trump is going to make that announcement on Saturday. Here's what we know, though. Uh, if it is her, then it, I think the situation is going to play out the way that I've just described. The Democrats are going to so overreach on this, it's going to turn off a lot of people. Democrats might still win the election because they might steal it in the mail, but it's, it's going to be Kavanaugh part two, except Amy Coney Barrett is even more sympathetic than Brett Kavanaugh, this milk toast lawyer. What we're seeing happen was just expressed in a viral video. And I think this viral video is the perfect symbol for how the Democrats are conducting themselves on the national level. A woman is driving her car. She sees some Trump supporters rallying on the side and she starts screaming at them and she starts flipping them off and she starts becoming very, very upset. And then as she's screaming, she crashes into the car in front of her. There she is screaming. F you oh, up. And there's the vendor bender up. Oh, whoopsie daisy. And then the, the Trump, because the, she's screaming at them, flipping them off. The Trump people are like, hey, hey, lady, how you doing? Then she crashes into the car, and obviously they start laughing and start joking about it. Then you hear the cops pull up. <laughs> oh, no, you, you're not telling me there happened to be cops there. And then the cops walk up to her and say, sorry, lady. That's what the Democrats are doing. They are screaming and yelling, and they're so full of rage that they're allowing themselves to crash their car. They're crashing their car right into the people in front of them, causing damage and getting themselves in a whole lot of trouble. Well, when your normal person is looking at that, which side are they going to turn to? All great news. If even my man Mitt is going to go toward the Trump side now, where does the rest of the country stand? That's our show. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producers, Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pavel Wadowski. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Audio mixer, Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, Nika Geneva. And production assistant, Ryan Love. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hey everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the American Republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon has turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the apocalypse with me, Andrew Claven. <laughs>